guys, Coda and I are back for chapters 35 and 36, so we will go ahead and get started. <laughs> that settles it, Minho said. Thomas stood next to him on the edge of the cliff, staring at the gray nothingness beyond. There was no sign of anything to the left, right, down, up, or ahead for as far as he could see. Nothing but a wall of blackness. Settles what? Thomas asked. We've seen it three times now. Something's up. Yeah. Thomas knew what he meant, but waited for Minho's explanation anyway. That dead griever I found, it ran this way, and we never saw it come back or go deeper into the maze. Then those suckers we tricked into jumping past us. Tricked? Thomas said, maybe not such a trick. Minho looked over at him, contemplative, meaning he's thinking. Hmm. Anyway, then this, he pointed out at the abyss. Not much doubt about it anymore. Somehow the grievers can leave the maze this way. Looks like magic, but so does the sun disappearing. If they can leave this way, Thomas added, continuing Minho's line of reasoning, so could we. A thrill of excitement shot through him. Minho laughed. There's your death wish again. Want to hang out with the grievers? Have a sandwich, maybe? Thomas felt his hopes drop. Got any better ideas? One thing at a time, Greeny. Let's get some rocks and test this place out. There has to be some kind of hidden exit. Thomas helped Minho as they scrabbled around the corners and crannies of the maze, picking up as many loose stones as possible. They got more by thumbing cracks in the rock, filling broken chunks onto the ground. When they finally had a sizable pile, they hauled it over right next to the edge and took a seat, feet dangling over the side. Thomas looked down and saw nothing but a gray descent. Minho pulled out his pad and pencil, placed them on the ground next to him. All right, we got to take good notes and memorize it in that shuck head of yours, too. If there's some kind of optical illusion hiding an exit from this place, I don't want to be the one who screws up when the first shank tries to jump into it. That shank ought to be the keeper of the runners, Thomas said, trying to make a joke to hide his fear. Being this close to a place where grievers might come out at any second was making him sweat. You'd want to hold on to one beauty of a rope. Minho picked up a rock from their pile. Yeah, okay. Let's take turns tossing them, zigzagging back and forth out there. If there's some kind of magical exit, hopefully it'll work with rocks too. Make them disappear. Thomas took a rock and carefully threw it to their left, just in front of where the left wall of the corridor leading to the cliff met the edge. The jagged piece fell and fell, then disappeared into the gray emptiness. Minho went next. He tossed his rock just a foot or so farther out than, that, than Thomas had. It also fell far below. Thomas threw another one, another foot out. Then Minho, each rock fell to the depths. Thomas kept following Minho's orders. They continued until they'd marked a line in, in reaching at least a dozen feet from the cliff, then moved their target pattern a foot to the right and started coming back toward the maze. All the rocks fell. Another line out, another line back. All the rocks fell. They threw enough rocks to cover the entire left half of the area in front of them, covering the distance anyone or anything could possibly jump. Thomas's discouragement grew with every toss until it turned into a heavy mass of blah. He couldn't help chiding himself. It had been a stupid idea. Then Minho's next rock disappeared. It was the strangest, most hard to believe thing Thomas had ever seen. Minho had thrown a large chunk, a piece that had fallen from one of the cracks in the wall. Thomas had watched, deeply concentrating on every each and every rock. This one left Minho's hand, sailed forward almost in the exact center of the cliff line, started its descent to the unseen far ground far below, and then it just vanished, as if it had fallen through a plane of water or mist. One second there, falling, next second, gone. Thomas couldn't speak. We've thrown stuff off the cliff before, Minho said. How could we have ever missed that? I never saw anything disappear, never. Thomas coughed, his throat felt raw. Do it again, maybe we blinked weird or something. Minho did, throwing it in the same spot, and once again, it winked out of existence. Maybe you weren't looking carefully other times you threw stuff over, Thomas said. I mean, it should be impossible. Sometimes you don't look very hard for things you don't believe will or can happen. They threw the rest of the rocks, aiming at the original spot and every inch around it. To Thomas's surprise, the spot in which the rocks disappeared proved only to be a few feet square. No wonder we missed it, Minho said, furiously writing down notes and dimensions, his best attempt at a, a diagram. It's kind of small. The grievers must barely fit through that thing. 
Thomas kept his eyes riveted to the area of the invisible floating square, trying to burn the distance and location in his mind, remember exactly where it was. And when they came out, they must balance on the rim of the hole and jump over the empty space to the cliff's edge. It's not that far. If I could jump it, I'm sure it's easy for them. Minho finished drawing and then looked up at the special spot. How's this possible, dude? What are we looking at? Like you said, it's not magic. Must be something like our sky turning gray. Some kind of optical illusion or hologram hiding a doorway. This place is all jacked up. And Thomas admitted to himself, kind of cool. His mind craved to know what kind of technology could be behind it all. Yeah, jacked up is right. Come on. Minho got up with a grunt and put on his backpack. Better get as much of the maze run as we can. With our new decorated sky, maybe other weird things that happened out there. We'll tell Newton Alby about this tonight. Don't know how it helps, but at least we know now where the shut grievers go. And probably where they come from, Thomas said as he took one last look at the hidden doorway. The griever hole. Yeah, good a name as any. Let's go. Thomas sat and stared, waiting for Minho to make a move. Several minutes passed in silence, and Thomas realized his friend must be as fascinated as he was. Finally, without saying a word, Minho turned to leave, and Thomas reluctantly followed as they ran into the dark gray maze. Thomas and Minho found nothing but stone walls and ivy. Thomas did a vine cutting, did the vine cutting and all the note taking, and it was hard for him to notice any changes from the day before, but Minho pointed out without even thinking about it where all the walls had moved. When they reached the final dead end, it was time to head back home. Thomas felt an almost uncontrollable urge to bag everything and stay there overnight and see what happened. Minho seemed to sense it and grabbed his shoulder. Not yet, dude. Not yet. And so they'd gone back. A somber mood rested over the glade. An easy thing to happen when all is gray. The dim light hadn't changed a bit since they'd woken up that morning, and Thomas wondered if anything would change at sunset either. Minho headed straight for the map room as they came through the west door. Thomas was surprised. He thought it was the last thing they should do. Aren't you dying to tell Newton Alby about the griever hole? Hey, we're still runners, Minho said. We still have a job. Thomas followed him to the steel door of the big concrete block, and Minho turned to give him a wan smile. But, yeah, we'll do it quick so we can talk to them. There were already other runners milling around the room, drawing up their maps when they entered. No one said one word, as if all speculation on the new sky had been exhausted. The hopelessness in the room made Thomas feel as if they were walking through mud-thick water. He knew he should be exhausted, but he was too excited to feel it. He couldn't wait to see Newt's and Albie's reactions to the news about the cliff. He sat down at the table and drew up the day's map based on his memory and notes. Minho looking over his shoulder the whole time, giving pointers. I think that hall was actually cut off here, not there. And watch your proportions, and draw straighter, you shank. He was annoying, but helpful, and 15 minutes after entering the, entering the room, Thomas examined his finished product. Pride washed through him. It was just as good as any other map he'd seen. Not bad, Minho said, for a greenie anyway. Minho got up and walked over to the section one trunk and opened it. Thomas knelt down in front of it and took out the map from the day before and held it up side by side with the one he'd just drawn. So what am I looking for, he asked. Patterns, but looking at two days worth isn't going to tell you jack. You really need to study several weeks, look for patterns, anything. I know there's something there, something that'll help us, just can't find it yet. Like I said, it sucks. Thomas had an itch in the back of his mind, the same one he'd felt the very first time in this room. The maze walls, moving, patterns, all those straight lines, were they suggesting an entirely different kind of map? Pointing to something? He had such a heavy feeling that he was missing an obvious hint or clue. Minho tapped him on the shoulder. You can always come back and study your butt off after dinner, after we talk to Newton Albee. Come on. Thomas put the papers in the trunk and closed it, hating the twinge of unease he felt. It was like a prick in his side. Walls moving, straight lines, patterns. There had to be an answer. Okay, let's go. They just stepped outside the map room, the heavy door clanging shut behind them when Newton Albee walked up, neither one of them looking very happy. Thomas's excitement immediately turned to worry. Hey, Minho said, we were just... Get on with it, I'll be interrupted. Ain't got time to waste. Find anything? Anything? Minho actually recoiled at the harsh rebuke, but his face seemed more confused to Thomas than hurt or angry. Nice to see you, too. Yeah, we did find something, actually. Oddly, I'll be almost looked disappointed. Because this whole shuck place has fallen to pieces. He shot Thomas a nasty glare as if it were all his fault. 
What's wrong with him? Thomas thought, feeling his own anger light up. They'd been working hard all day, and this was their thanks? What do you mean? Minho asked. What else happened? Newt answered, nodding toward the box as he did so. Bloody supplies didn't come today. Come every week for two years, same time, same day, but not today. All four of them looked over at the steel doors attached to the ground. To Thomas, there seemed to be a shadow hovering over it, darker than the gray air surrounding everything else. Ha <laughs> ha, we're shucked for good now, Minho whispered, his reaction alerting Thomas to how grave the situation really was. No sun for the plants, Newt said. No supplies from the bloody box. Yeah, I'd say we're shucked all right. Albie had folded his arms, still glaring at the box as if trying to open the doors with his mind. Thomas hoped their leader didn't bring up what he'd seen in the changing or anything related to Thomas for that matter, especially now. Yeah, anyway, Minho continued, we found something weird. Thomas waited, hoping that Newt or Albie would have a positive reaction to the news, maybe even have further information to shed light on their mystery. Newt raised his eyebrows. What? Minho took... A th full three minutes to explain, starting with the griever they followed and ending with the results of their rock-throwing experiment. Must lead to where the, you know, grievers live, he said when he finished. The griever hole, Thomas added. All three of them looked at him, annoyed, as if he had no right to speak. But for the first time, being treated like a greenie didn't bother him that much. Gotta bloody see that for myself, Newt said, then murmured, hard to believe. Thomas couldn't have agreed more. I don't know what we can do, Minho said. Maybe we could build something to block off that corridor. No way, Newt said. Shuck things can climb the bloody walls, remember? Nothing we could build could keep them out. But a commotion outside the homestead shifted their attention away from the conversation. A group of gladers stood at the front door of the house, shouting to be heard over each other. Chuck was in the group, and when he saw Thomas and the others, he ran over. A look of excitement spread across his face. Thomas could only wonder what crazy thing happened now. What's going on? Newt asked. She's awake, Chuck yelled. The girl's awake. Thomas's insides twisted. He leaned against the concrete wall of the map room. The girl, the girl who spoke in his head. He wanted to run before it happened again, before she spoke to him in his mind. But it was too late. Tom, I don't know any of these people. Come get me. It's all fading. I'm forgetting everything but you. I have to tell you things. But it's all fading. He couldn't understand how she did it, how she was inside his head. Teresa paused and then said something that made no sense. The maze is a code, Tom. The maze is a code. Chapter 36 Thomas didn't want to see her. He didn't want to see anybody. As soon as Newt set off to go to talk to the girl, Thomas silently slipped away, hoping no one would notice him in the excitement. With everyone's thoughts on the stranger waking up from her coma, it proved easy. He skirted the edge of the glade, then, breaking into a run, he headed for his place of seclusion behind the deadhead forest. He crouched in the corner, nestled in the ivy, and threw his blanket over himself, head and all. Somehow it seemed like a way to hide from Teresa's intrusion into his mind. A few minutes passed, his heart finally calming to a slow roll. Forgetting about you was the worst part. At first, Thomas thought it was another message in his head. He squeezed his fists against his ears, but no. It had been different. He heard it with his ears. A girl's voice. Chills creeping up his spine, he slowly lowered the blanket. Teresa stood to his right, leaning against the massive stone wall. She looked so different now, awake and alert, standing, wearing a long-sleeved white shirt, blue jeans, and brown shoes. She looked impossibly even more striking than when he'd seen her in a coma. Black hair fanned the fair skin of her face, with eyes the blue of pure flame. Tom, do you really not remember me? Her voice was soft, a contrast from the crazed, hard sound he'd heard from from her after she first arrived, when she delivered the message that everything was going to change. You mean, you remember me, he asked, looking embarrassed at the squeak that escaped on the last word. Yes, no, maybe. She threw her arms up in disgust. I can't explain it. Thomas opened his mouth and closed it without saying anything. I remember remembering, she muttered. Sitting down with a heavy sigh, she pulled her legs up to wrap her arms around her knees. Feelings, emotions, like I have all of these shelves in my head labeled for memories and faces, but they're empty, as if everything before this is just on the other side of a white curtain, including you. But how do you know me? He felt like the walls were spinning around him. Teresa turned toward him. I don't know. Something about before we came to the maze. Something about us. It's mostly empty, like I said. You know about the maze? Who told you? You just woke up. I, it's all very confusing right now. She held a hand out, but... I know you're my friend. 
Almost in a day as Thomas pulled the blanket completely off and leaned forward to shake her hand. I like how you call me Tom. As soon as it came out, he wasn't sure he couldn't have possibly said anything dumber. Teresa rolled her eyes. That's your name, isn't it? Well, yeah, but most people call me Thomas. Well, except Newt. He calls me Tommy. Tom makes me feel like I'm at home or something, even though I don't know what home is. He let out a bitter laugh. Are we messed up or what? She smiled for the first time, and he almost had to look away as if something that nice didn't belong in such a glum and gray place, as if he had no right to look at her expression. Yeah, we're messed up, she said, and I'm scared. So am I, trust me, which was definitely the understatement of the day. A long pause, uh, a long moment passed, both of them looking toward the ground. What's, he began, not sure how to ask it, how did you talk to me inside my head? Teresa shook her head. No idea, I can just do it, she thought to him. Then she spoke aloud again. It's like if you tried to ride a bicycle here, if they had one. I bet you could do it without thinking, but do you remember learning to ride one? No, I mean, I remember riding one, but not learning. He paused, feeling a wave of sadness. Or who taught me? Well, she said, her eyes flickering as if she was embarrassed by his sudden gloom. Anyway, it's kind of like that. Really clears things up. Teresha shrugged. You didn't tell anyone, did you? They'd think you were crazy. Well, when it first happened, I did, but I think Newt just thinks I was stressed out or something. Thomas felt fidgety, like he'd go nuts if he didn't move. He stood up, started pacing in front of her. We need to figure things out. That weird note you had about being the last person to ever come here, your coma, the fact that you can talk to me telepathically, any ideas? Teresa followed him with her eyes as he walked back and forth. Save your breath and quit asking. All I have are faint impressions that you and I were important and that we were used somehow, that we're smart, that we came here for a reason. I know I triggered the ending, whatever that means. She groaned, her face reddening. My memories are as useless as yours. Thomas knelt down in front of her. No, they're not. I mean, the fact that you knew my memory had been wiped without asking me and this other stuff, you're way ahead of me and everybody else. Their eyes met for a long time. It looked like her mind was spinning, just trying to make sense of it all. I just don't know, she said in his mind. There you go again, Thomas said aloud, although he was relieved that her trick didn't really freak him out anymore. How do you do that? I just do. I bet you can too. Well, can't say I'm too anxious to try. He sat back down and pulled his legs up, much like she had done. You said something to me in my head right before you found me over here. You said, the maze is a code. What did you mean? She shook her head slightly. When I first woke up, it was like I'd entered an insane asylum. These strange guys hovering over my bed, the world tipping around me, memories swirling in my brain. I tried to reach out and grasp a few, and that was one of them. I can't really remember why I said it. Was there anything else? Well, actually, yeah. She pulled up the sleeve of her left arm, exposing her bicep. Small letters were written across the skin in thin black ink. What's that? He asked, leaning in for a better look. Read it yourself. The letters were messy, but he could make them out when he got close enough. Wicked is good. Thomas's heart beat faster. I've seen the word wicked. He searched his mind for what the phrase could possibly mean. On the little creatures that live there, the beetle blades. What are those? She asked. Just like lizard-like machines that spy on us for the creators, the people who sent us here. Teresa considered that for a moment, looking off into the space, into space. Then she focused on her arm. I can't remember why I wrote this, she said, as she wet her thumb and started rubbing off the words. But don't let me forget, it has to mean something. The three words ran through Thomas's mind over and over. When did you write it? When I woke up, they had a pen and notepad next to the bed, and in the commotion I wrote it down. Thomas was baffled by this girl. First the connection he'd felt to her from the very beginning, then the mind speaking, now this. Everything about you is weird. You know that, right? Judging by your little hiding spot, I'd say you're not so normal yourself. Like living in the woods, do you? Thomas tried to scowl and then smiled. He felt pathetic and embarrassed about hiding. Well, you look familiar to me and you claim we're friends. I guess I'll trust you. He held out his hand for another shake and she took it, holding on to it for a long time. A chill swept through Thomas that was surprisingly pleasant. All I want to do is get back home, she said, finally letting go of his hand, just like the rest of you. Thomas's heart sank as he snapped back to reality and remembered how grim the world had become. Yeah, well, things pretty much suck about, about now right here. The sun disappeared and the sky's gone gray. They didn't send us weekly supplies. Looks like things are going to end up one end one way or another. 
But before Teresa could answer, Newt was running out of the woods. How in the, he said as he pulled up in front of them, Albie and a few others were right behind him. Newt looked at Teresa. How'd you get here? Medjack said you were, the, you were there one second and bug and gone the next. Teresa stood up, surprising Thomas with her confidence. Guess he forgot to tell the little part about me kicking him, kicking him and climbing out the window. Thomas almost laughed as Newt turned to an older boy standing nearby whose face had turned bright red. Congrats, Jeff, Newt said. You're officially the first guy here to get your butt beat by a girl. Teresa didn't stop. Keep talking like that and you'll be next. Newt turned back to face them, but his face showed anything but fear. He stood silently, just staring at them. Thomas stared back, wondering what was going through the older boy's head. Albie stepped up. I'm sick of this. He pointed at Thomas's chest, almost tapping it. I want to know who you are, who this shank girl is, and how you guys know each other. Thomas almost wilted. Albie, I swear, she came straight to you after waking up, shuck face. Anger surged inside Thomas and worry that Albie would go off like Ben had. So what? I know her. She knows me, or at least we used to. That doesn't mean anything. I can't remember anything. Neither can she. Albie looked at Teresa. What did you do? Thomas, confused by the question, glanced at Teresa to see if she knew what he meant, but she didn't reply. What did you do? Albie screamed. First the sky, now this. I triggered something, she replied in a calm voice. Not on purpose, I swear it. The ending? I don't know what it means. What's wrong, Newt? Thomas asked, not wanting to talk to Albie directly. What happened? But Albie grabbed him by the shirt. What happened? I'll tell you what happened, Shank. Too busy making lovey eyes to bother looking around, to bother noticing what freaking time it is. Thomas looked at his watch, realizing with horror that he'd missed what he'd missed, knowing what Albie was about to say before he said it. The walls you shuck, the doors, they didn't close tonight. Ooh, that's a good cliffhanger. Okay, we're going to stop there and pick up with chapter 37. I think that's for next week. So, bye.